multi house families, but that's how they define what's a household. But if you go to East uh, Africa, the, the, what you interpret as a household is very different. So even defining what a household is and how that relates to the cultural context is very, very important. So you had to give a definition even to the enumerator on the field. A household is uh, the number of people that eat from the same kitchen. Whether that included the servants, whether that included helpers, that's <laughs> how you define a household. Because otherwise, there's no comparable way for us to understand what a household is constituted by. <coughs> yeah. So mixed methods, really, really important to think about uh, <laughs> mixed methods. One example of some other work that we did in Pakistan was amongst tax collectors. And we needed to understand what can increase tax collection among, uh, what can incentivize tax collectors to increase their tax collections without penalizing citizens and without them feeling intimidated. And we learned, we did a lot of qualitative work amongst these tax collectors to understand their idioms, their strengths, and their challenges to then even design the basic work that was, um, the basic intervention that was done there. And this work was done by um, IDC that I had quoted in um, the UK. The second is, it takes a village to understand whether programs are making a difference or not. You need, you know, the designer of the program, you need the <laughs> analyst, you need the uh, anthropologist, you need the ethnographer, um, basically it takes a village. Yeah? You're not going to be able to do it just sitting one person by yourself in your little ivory room or tower and try and understand how a program works. So think about that. But also think about, and this is my last, um, my last sort of idea out there, also think about what makes programs finally successful. More often than not, most development programs have thought, we'll put the programs out there. As long as people are learning, they will change their behavior. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. Daniel Kahneman, Tversky, Amos Tversky, now more recently Richard Taylor, have talked over and over again, <coughs> again about behavioral insights. You need to go the last mile to understand whether your programs are making a difference. So <clears throat> these are favorite groups of mine. Exactly. How do you change people's <coughs> behavior? You can make them learn all you want. I know I need to go to the gym every day. I don't. I know uh, doctors know a completely different example. Doctors know that they need to wash their hands. Of all people in the world, doctors should know this, that they need to wash hands before surgeries. There was a study that was done in the 1990s that found that there were 100,000 deaths that were caused in the United States alone because doctors didn't wash their hands before surgery. <laughs> doctors, yeah? And so there was a whole lot of experimentation that was done. And, you know, I can <coughs> tell you about how that went. But important thing is clearly it's not just knowledge that is important to change our behavior. Something else has to change. Something has to trigger our brain to change our behavior, yeah? So some insights that are coming from the behavioral insights field, <laughs> comparisons help. Comparing us with people that we associate with changes our behavior. So this is one example of, um, and Uni and I live in Korea. We get our electricity bills, we are compared against similar households. Our electricity bill is compared against similar households. So we don't know who these households are, but we know what the average of the neighborhood is. And our electricity bill is basically posited against that. But this started off in the UK where people's bills were then compared with what was happening in the neighborhood because that's where more, pe more similar people are going to stay. Yeah? That changes how you consume electricity because you know whether you're doing worse off or better off than the people around you. You can't get behavior change unless you mobilize the entire community. Yeah? So one of the things, you have to get people to be <coughs> aware of how these behaviors need to change. One of the things that I do in my office when people declare their goals is that we come and announce these goals out in the open to everybody else. It creates a norm and a knowledge around everyone. Everyone knows that this is what you're aiming to do. They will change their behavior to accommodate what your behavior change is going to be. But community mobilization, and this is in developing countries, has been found to be much more important in changing behavior for HIV AIDS, for, uh, for abstinence. Uh, it, you cannot change behavior one person at a time. You need to think about communities. 
Um, how you frame choices is really important. If you have a big plate or a small plate, it's going to make a big difference to how much you eat. If I take that small plate, I'm not going to go back for my second helping or my third helping but I'll definitely put in much more food into my big plate. So uh, behavioral scientists in the UK actually did away with the idea of getting trays for people who come into canteens. Because you can't, in trays you end up piling up a lot of your food even if you're not going to eat it. But when you are forced to carry just a plate, you'll eat lesser. Even though you know you have to eat lesser, you don't eat it less, eat lesser. So you need nudges. And so this is what they did. Social recognition helps amongst your peer community. So another study that was done in Zambia to understand female contraception, the research team uh, from uh, Boston University actually worked with hairdressers because hairdressers mm -hmm. spend a lot of time with women, right? You spend about four hours, every woman in Zimbabwe, did I say Zambia? Uh, Zimbabwe w would spend at least three to four hours with a hairdresser who was braiding a hair the best time for you to be talking about you know, contraception or <laughs> changes in attitudes, etc. But they tried different things. They tried to understand, okay, financial incentives, would that get these hairdressers to you know, get them to talk about contraception and changes in behavior? Or, so, or putting a star on top of their shops. No surprises? Getting a star up on the top of these shops where these hairdressers were then lined up in front of the community and, and were hailed as community champions was far more effective than giving them small financial incentives because they felt recognized amongst the people that they cared for. So <clears throat> evidence needs to be built, but we need to consider behavioral science in understanding what works in the last mile. So conclusions. Build high quality evidence on what works, but think about bias and think about your causal pathways when you're doing that. Second, tracking implementation fidelity is key. And within that, think about frequency, think about dosage, and think about uh, timing. Third, <coughs> measure what you treasure. Yeah. Think about what the ultimate goal is and then measure that. Timing of evaluations is critical. Mixed methods are best, much like Martini's. And last, behavioral science is needed to understand the last mile. There was a study that was cited in the New York Times that said that people who spend time um, acknowledging how grateful they are for all of the opportunities that have been given to them, even if they haven't. So there was a randomized control trial. Um, after 10 weeks of them writing down every day what the things that they're grateful for, those people in that treatment group were far happier than the people in the control group. Taking that lesson, I'm really grateful that all of you are here. Thank you very much. Joe, thank you for a fantastic lecture. Very insightful and useful. Let's have the and question and answer. <laughs> Okay, we start uh, with George Meros, development economist, agricultural so, economist. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. It was uh, like uh, having a window to the world. <laughs> uh, for us uh, who have not been very uh, uh, familiar with what happens in the developing world, uh, it has been a very important lecture. But also, uh, it is important for the method you have outlined. Evidence-based policy is something which has been missing in Greece. And uh, if our students learn how to address questions of policy based on evidence, on hard evidence, and how to get that hard evidence is very important. Um, I would like to take one Please. 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds for just saying two things. The first is that we are in Greece here in the midst of economic crisis and we need economic reforms and people do not understand how to address these reforms. One very important issue during these reforms has been the issue of ownership. You did not put the word ownership in your lecture and 
I would like to know something more about that. And also, uh, you have been very uh, focusing on poverty and uh, food issues and household issues. <coughs> have you something to say about the economic reforms and how these economic reforms are being better implemented? And also would like to take the opportunity to say that uh, recently uh, the, European, the, the, the Greek Evaluation Society has been established here uh, as a chapter of the European Evaluation Society. The next um, Congress, the bi bi biannual Congress of the European Evaluation Society will take uh, place in Thessaloniki mm -hmm. in October. So anyone who is interested in evaluation and impact evaluation, please be there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. You want to take a few questions? Let's take a few questions. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the, this very interesting presentation. I have a question that is, is coming from the problems that I deal with my research on the impact assessment of uh, investments of sovereign wealth. Uh, when I was working on this, I came to realize that what is considered a success from recipient countries or a successful design and implementation is not necessarily considered as a successful from the donor's side. So uh, I came to realize that it's important to uh, include in this uh, impact assessment analysis different views, not necessarily being you know, uh, the same. And I was wondering, is there a way to weight these different priorities and opinions on what should come first in this assessment or not, in terms of donors and recipients? <coughs> Let me have, uh, have one more question. Andrea? Um, you mentioned the, the uh, Millennium Villages. I was just wondering what is the most recent evidence on the success of those and whether that's something that... And maybe explain for the students what the Millennium say, Villages are, because I'm not and, sure they know. And, and maybe a thoughtful one word on where we are in terms of actual uh, success of climate fund and evaluation of projects relating to climate fund. These are big questions. Big course, question. And let me ask one final question. This was a, actually a formidable uh, presentation of the complexities that exist in doing impact evaluation. Is there something, from your experience, is there um, a book or a guide to development economies, given all this complexity on how to proceed with impact evaluation? Because the causal chains are so complex mm -hmm. that, and the dimensions that you brought out, that I'm afraid people might be lost in the process. Okay, these are not <laughs> easy questions. <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> so, um, okay, let me start from the last first, because at least I know how to answer that question very, very clearly. So Luca, on the on guide uh, for impact assessment, actually there are quite a few nice books. Mm -hmm. One is uh, led by Paul Gertler. Mm -hmm. So Paul oh. Gertler, G-E-R-T-L-E-R. -E okay. um, he and his co-authors have put together a very nice, <coughs> you know, field um, field guide for impact evaluations, etc. Now. Having said which, I'm not sure that something is going to give you a definitive guide on how to develop um, good theories of change, for example. But I think if you if you start with the idea that yes, you want to have good theory-based impact assessments or impact evaluations, that's a good place to start. And then, of course, you have a whole lot of other references that I can help you with. So I also uh, I teach uh, impact evaluation in practice at Columbia. And uh, what I do get the students to do is then look at a whole lot of other papers and I'm happy to share my reading list with you. Yeah. Okay, so Andrea. Okay, um, on the Millennium Villages, uh, just to give you a bit quick context on what the Millennium Villages are. Um, the, the, uh, the initial idea was that there needs to be a proof of concept. That yes, it is possible to take people out of poverty. And Jeff and a whole lot of his uh, colleagues then decided that they, we, much like the uh, SDSN, we need to bring good scientific rigor, well, scientific understanding and insights into how to d 
design programs that have been proven at least in science, but not so much on the ground. So this was a proof of concept idea. And in 2005, uh, the, it was essentially rolled out across 14 countries in Africa with, um, I think, each cluster uh, being anything from 50,000 to 500,000 people. Yeah, so this and 14 countries. So this was a large experiment. Um, <coughs> that I had um, <coughs> the opportunity to then engage with the Millennium Villages when I joined them in 2007. Um, but so the question that you asked was, well, what is the evidence with respect to the MVs? Um, and sorry, just as an aside, it's a it was a very interesting um, experiment or proof of concept uh, idea because it brought together health, agriculture, infrastructure, finance, um, uh, uh, yeah, all of those sectors together, with the idea being that, look, you need all of these to come together to take people out of poverty, much like the graduating from ultra poverty idea, right? The problem with, um, with that was, and Jeff knows this, I'm, it's not like I'm saying something behind his back, the problem uh, with that idea was that they didn't plan for evidence right from the beginning. And so, and I was brought on as the impact assessment advisor and there were many times that I had, I had to go through an existential crisis to them because I, I didn't know how we were dealing with measurement of impact at the same time as we were thinking about proof of concept. Uh, so in 2008 actually, there was a study that was published in the Lancet, I'm not sure, um, yeah, so that, which was, um, which tried to show that yes, there had been an impact of the Millennium Villages on, for example, sanitation indicators and, um, and other indicators related to children. But that paper got retracted at the end of May of 2008 uh, because there were several errors in it uh, that, CG, that the Center for Global Development researchers there basically found. And um, I know Jeff ended up writing a note saying, look, we are apologetic. But the, it, was, it was a very big study that got published by Lancet. Uh, after that, I haven't seen any new work that's been done around the evidence part of this, but I do know that Jeff has uh, managed different parts of this in different ways. So, for example, with the government of Tanzania's work then to roll out malaria and HIV programs, etc. But it's not been in the same cohesive synth synthetic way as um, as the Millennium Villages were, which I thought were an incredible and wonderfully ambitious program. And I think the only tweak that we needed there was, I wish they'd built evidence right from the beginning. Um, so, and the second part of your question was climate funds and how are we building evaluations into those? Is that the idea? So, um, great question. Uh, <coughs> I br got brought on at the Green Climate Fund as the first head of the Independent Evaluation Office a year ago. And um, before that, no one was thinking about evaluation because like most development agencies or environment agencies, your basic focus is on rolling out programs. Mm -hmm. you don't, you're not thinking about evaluation, right? Or you're not thinking about success. Because you think, well, just rolling or out is success. Or, or monitoring, exactly. And it sort of relates to the question that you're asking as well. The climate fund was definitely thinking that as long as we roll out these programs, as a donor, that's all, that's success for us. But clearly, that's not what is happening on the ground. And so since then, we've had many reports of uh, there being variable success, and however you mean success. So what we are trying to do, my team and I, is building that culture right from the beginning into program managers' heads and into their designs so that we can build that evidence and see it when it comes out. <coughs> so uh, the idea is that there is an evaluation policy. Sorry, this is a bit of uh, you know organization speak, but we're building evaluation policies, but also now methodologies that, that can help to uh, measure successes of these programs as they go along. But all, um, all program implementations uh, need to have good evaluations now built into them, otherwise they don't get passed. So that's our big success for now. On your question, to what extent can you weigh uh, different uh, different goals of uh, donors versus recipients. I don't think I've seen... First, indicators are a necessary evil. So we have to recognize that. I mean, they are necessary because they help to measure something, but they're evil because by themselves they're partial. 
Um, I think um, my experience with donor agencies is that they are great as, as a way to um, transform how programs are being designed and measured because they are the ones who are really keen to understand what effects that they're making on the ground. So UK aid, for example, there's a big national constituency that wants to understand, well, for every dollar, that every pound that we are spending, what kind of an effect? Uh, somewhat controversially and arguably, I, I think I might present that unless that uh, push is there from the donor side, you're not going to find a lot of recipients wanting to evaluate programs. Uh, on the yet, only if you want to sort of say, yes, how many packages are being put out there, et cetera, much more monitoring type of indicators, I think you know, that does get done. But I don't think reaching the end user or the beneficiary is something that a lot of agencies are doing with a lot of rigor. And that rigor and that credibility needs to be built into a program. So sorry, I'm punting the question, I realize. But uh, I don't think there's a way. Right. But I think you answered it. If I could say something, I think you answered is the following: that if targets are different, then you build different indicators. So donors might have and that ties also to one of the questions that George Meadows brought: that donors have their own goals <laughs> to achieve. So they build different indicators than what recipient countries might. And have. agencies have the same thing. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I faced that in Afghanistan. I was for two and a half years coordinator of humanitarian assistance. And each agency had its own uh, goals. 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 Some evaluated, some did not. Yeah. Monitoring, we did, but yeah. no more than that. Yeah. And, and I presume also that the actual formation of these goals in the agency exactly. is a process of give yeah, and take absolutely. between donors and, and recipient mm -hmm. countries that eventually evolve. Now, what, whether that process is, is rational and and, and, and what the internal weighting is in terms of that evolution is, a, is an interesting question, of course. Yeah, and the extent to which they are owned, which is, I yes. think, the question that uh, you asked, which yes. is a really good question. I um, have to confess, I took out that slide on, I didn't call it ownership, but I called it, uh, I call it stakeholder engagement, yeah. which is sort of yeah. my way of, <coughs> yeah. But unless you can, so I took out that slide thinking this is a very long presentation, so forgive me for that. But uh, it's a really good question, and I, I think all of the questions that you asked were really about ownership of these results, right? And unless you can build these in right from the beginning, it, nothing goes forward. They forget behavioral insights. Yeah, you can nudge people all you want, but nothing gets built unless you build that. And so, th for example, in, uh, when we started to even build impact assessments and designs, one of the things we found was that you could come in, you know, be a hotshot researcher, build identification designs into these impact evaluations, but if the if the recipient did not know that this evaluation was going on, and if you only <coughs> came and sort of presented a news item at the end saying, oh, you made a you know 7% difference on impact, it didn't get picked up at all. You needed to involve them right at the design phase for them to then get excited about, um, about these. So one of the unintended consequences, I think, of building impact assessments in programs has been not that they're going to show you fantastic, you know, mind-blowing results. What they help you to do is to put in discipline into the programs. And that changes the quality of programs dramatically. Built because one of the things that we ask for is this engagement. Continuous engagement as you go along, which doesn't get built into a lot of programming. So uh, I think your point on ownership was just right on the mark. That there is nothing related to that. The counterfactual. Yeah. How do you define the counterfactual? Because comparing a control group with the treatment group is correct. But how do you define the control group? Yeah. And I have experience on that, and this is something different. Next I'll lecture. I'll come back <laughs> definitely for another lecture on building counterfactuals. But <coughs> I, I think it's one of the most fascinating parts of um, assessments. And I'd like to submit respectfully that I think you can always find a way to build counterfactuals in interesting ways, whether you use natural experiments or you use artificial counter, uh, counterfactuals, and now there's also called um, 
So something that Achimoglu has started, yeah. which is um, synthetic counterfactuals, right? Yeah. So you can do a lot of that, uh, but yeah, it's a different discussion, but a really good one. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope you come back. I'm sure we will have many, many more questions. Bigger amphitheater. But thank you in a bigger amphitheater. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Παιδιά, όσοι από εσά θα είναι έξω στο τραπεζάκι, θέλουν να πάρουν ένα πιστοποιητικό, είναι έξω στο τραπέζι, μπορείτε να το πάρετε. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.